And there we are. There we are. We, we made it another week. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, survived another week, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. How's Robin? Um, it's more comfortable this week than it has the last couple of weeks anyway. <laughs> so, didn't, yeah, 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 I'm like, where are you at? I don't recognize, the place looks yeah, really. familiar, but. Well, it's like yeah. last week when you had Nick on, I, I heard about every other word it seemed like because like uh, my connection was horrible over there yeah so, when uh, nick was on yeah yep so it's like but i couldn't go in the building because there's people in there so it's like i had to kind of hang out the uh the motor home and uh that yeah way up, so yeah so, how's things at Rhodes hotel uh not too bad busy um yeah everything's uh booking up pretty steady so uh that's a good thing so you know and then the the uh, public investigations that we have every month are are uh, kind of booking up as we uh, approach them each month. Uh, I think, which reminds me, I think there's a couple of tickets left for the one on July sixteenth. Uh, I don't remember when it is, sixteenth, <laughs> something <laughs> like that. I can't remember the date. There's too many dates to remember. Too many, too many months, and yeah. But yeah, I understand yeah. that. Yeah, yeah we've. We've actually got a public this weekend, Friday and Saturday. We've got some tickets still left, and this has been kind of a strange year for public uh, public investigations. Like we yeah. usually book ours are filled up, and I get people calling me wanting in and everything else. But this year it seems like it's been kind of slow. I talked to others that have basically said the same thing that it's been a little slow. They thought this year too, as far as it uh, private investigations have gone crazy. I mean, we're just like we're booking a yeah. lot of those up, but, uh, but yeah, the other ones are a little slow. Yeah, yeah, I've noticed that here too. I mean, usually we sell them all out, and there's been a few of them that you know it's been close, but haven't sold them out though. So, yep. Well, we'll see uh, how July goes um, with it. You, I like I barely made it into the show. It's like I was sitting. I was what I had like UFOs. The lost evidence was on, and I'm just like just like watching everything and I looked and I was like, Oh, I got to go. <laughs> so I like, turned everything off and run over the computer real quick to jump on here. So it's like, and Rob would be here sitting here and you guys would be talking to be like nine 30 and be like, where's my cap? So he's out there watching his UFO show. Watching UFOs. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, anybody wants to just go out there and uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, just uh, LLF radio on YouTube. We've got all the, uh, all the broadcasts are on there. All the episodes are on there. And uh, so jump in there, sign in on that. You can be one of the other 10 people that have signed in on it. <laughs> I think we're in the 30s now. No kidding. Huh? It's no smashing. kidding. I think, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I think we everybody's just, just watching from here. <laughs> yeah. And it's easy to watch it on Facebook or something like that. But uh, yeah. yeah. Do it like that. But And I don't know. I, I don't think I, I got to figure it out if I can or not. I like, I like watching or listening to some podcasts and everything when I'm in my car driving, like down to Ashmore and all. So I got two hours, so I can listen to them. I, I listen to some weird podcasts. So there's some some weirdos that do it. There's some guy and a girl. So I think one of those guys <laughs> you might have on your little letters, you know, in just a little bit. But uh, I listen to their yeah. podcasts on there and uh, listen to a few yeah. other ones. So good thing, good time to do yeah. it if you're traveling like that. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, it's nice. Definitely. Yeah. And especially with me, I don't have like, you know, I don't have access to like this. The satellite radio is gone now. So now I just need to pull up like podcasts and stuff on the phone and just like plug in and, and uh, listen. That's probably what I'll do on the way to Michigan Paracon in August. <laughs> just listen as many as I can on the way up. Uh, you got quite a bit of time. You can catch up with some there. So. That's yeah, sure. it's only like seven and a half hours to kill some time. So I, I could probably squeeze in a few podcasts. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, I've got about, I think it's about 10 hours or so for me, 10, 10 and a half hours, something like that. So it's a little bit of a drive. Yeah. 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 You got me beat for sure. Yeah. yeah well, well, thanks I for everybody I tuning in. <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 Everybody's yeah. jumping in here, waiting here <clears throat> from uh, the weirdo himself tonight. So yeah. Just, I'm, yeah. Just waiting to hear again. some weird talk tonight. <laughs> so I, great guy can't uh looking forward to it so. uh, yeah yeah no it's, it's like we it's, like you said we don't we don't ever get a chance i mean you're the cons and stuff i mean it's 
it's a, Hey, how are you? How you been? It's like, as you're passing each other, you got a few minutes to really talk and you might get a few minutes, like, you know, each day or something, but you really don't get much time to where you can really talk and hang out and, and catch up. So it's kind of nice. I mean, doing this and, you know, yeah. Hang out for well, a there's while. so many people that want to, uh, so many people that just go to their tables and want to meet the people and stuff like that too, that have never met the guys or, you know, or John or any of the other ones. So yeah, it's just, yeah. You hate to take that time away from those people there, you know? So yeah. So kind of like, hey, how you guys doing? That's it. And kind of wander away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let, let everybody that, that doesn't get much opportunity, you know, or might be the first opportunity because, you know, it might be the first con or something they went to and not get the chance to really, hang out with right. these guys yeah yeah Good. well what do you think i think we ought to bring john in and uh get things rolling with him and uh let's do it he's got going on all right there he is so he's, the eyes are open he's ready to go <laughs> <laughs> how you doing tonight guys uh good how, you how you doing sir i'm doing well you know i was listening to you talk and i was thinking i have to i've the bal i do this weird balancing act at conventions because you know, I grew up going to comic book conventions and metaphysical conventions. And at the same time, I was in rock and roll bands and punk rock bands. And so there's this weird thing in me when I do a convention now and I'm there as a guest. Obviously, I, I smoke. I smoke cigarettes. And I found that, at least for me, when we talk about never having time to hang out with people, like people complain, I'm never at my table. But the reality is it's usually because I'm outside and I'm talking to six, seven, sometimes, you know, one or two, but sometimes six, seven or eight people. And I can really get a good conversation going. And sometimes when I'm at my table, I feel really stifled because, you know, someone's standing in front of me and there's another person who doesn't want to interrupt that conversation and come up and talk. And I'm, I'm the type of person who always like, Oh no, everybody come over to the table and talk. Like mm -hmm. I want to get conversations generated and started, but then I have to realize too, you know, there's so many people who go to these events for the first time and they're nervous to approach anyone. They're nervous to even talk about a paranormal experience they may have had. You know, the, you, you, you both know the great thing about these conventions or group investigations is that it provides an atmosphere where people can feel free to talk about their stuff but there's still so many people who need to approach you one-on-one -on -one because they don't want to say what they think sounds crazy or what their families told them is weird their whole lives no i agree with you and and you know yeah. what most people don't understand don't realize either until they get there is everybody at these conventions is so approachable it's not a matter of like, oh, I don't want to talk to you. I mean, I've only ran into one person with that whole situation where he didn't really want to talk to anybody and just was like just there and that was it. But everybody's so approachable and so easy to talk to and all. It's just it's it's like a big family. It's just great to go to these and, and talk to people. And whether they're on TV or just, you know, somebody that just kind of comes out and has wrote a couple of books or been involved with a little bit of things. And it's just they're all the same. Yeah, absolutely. I just got back. I did a, one of Amy Bruni's events and we were at Belvoir Winery in, in Missouri. And it works to my benefit, but people always ask me like, so at Belvoir, they have the different locations that the groups can rotate through. And Amy always puts me out in this cemetery that's way out back behind the, the winery. And I'm there every year and, and guests show up who are who know the event they're like, why are you always back here? Or new people are like, well, what are we doing back here? Like, there's not really anything. It's a cemetery and it's spooky and has some legends behind it. But, you know, at night it's hard to hunt a cemetery. Plus there's a residential neighborhood nearby, a lot of contamination from noise. And I tell them, you know, Amy puts me outside at these events so I can smoke. But it also means that we all have an opportunity. Like I have an opportunity to literally just talk with each person in each group and be able to give them moments that a lot of times you don't get in a group investigation. Yep. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice when you have these smaller groups, like, you know, at times some of these places when you're kind of spread out and you, you're able to have more time to really be able to answer questions and just talk to people and, you know, give them your thoughts and input and stuff on everything. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. And you're outside, you can do a little UFO gazing while you're up there, too. You know what? I think it was my last group of the night. I was uh, 
I had a little fire going out by the cemetery and people could roast marshmallows if they want to. And there was a group of three or four people that just laid on their backs and they just <laughs> UFO watched and listened to me tell ghost stories. <laughs> there you go. Ghost stories around the campfire watching for UFOs. You can't beat that. <laughs> Sounds like a great yeah. life to me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. yeah. It doesn't get any better than that. You know, and I tell each group too, because just just comes with years of doing events. I tell every group, you know, even if you don't see a ghost this weekend, or if you came to this event and you were hoping to see a ghost, even if you don't see a ghost, when you go back to work on Monday, you were in a haunted location with a bunch of ghost hunters and other weirdos and looking at the sky for UFOs and wandering through old buildings looking for ghosts. Like, even if you don't see a ghost, you win on Monday. Everybody else is going to be talking about what rerun they watched on television or, you know, uh, how much, how many chores they had to do. And you can be like, well, I didn't see a ghost, but I went to a haunted location and I hung out with a bunch of weirdos and talked about weird crap for the entire weekend. Yep. <laughs> and you're usually with a lot of people you don't know and uh, and you meet a bunch of new people there. Why, why they're all sitting in the bar. You know, the, the other buddies are all sitting in the bar hung over on Monday because they've had a long weekend and, and you're just bubbling with the excitement from the, from the weekend out investigating all. And, and you guys can attest to the fact that now I don't know what it is about the paranormal community, but I mean, it can take one single event and you make friends that you have for decades. Like mm -hmm. it's amazing. Yep. Well, and, and yeah. that's how Mike and I got to know each other was an event that he put on and I brought the mystery machine yeah. to, and uh, mm -hmm. we got to, we met each other at that event and, uh, and I've ruined his life ever since. <laughs> <laughs> Put up with him ever since then. I know. I think I, Crystal and Matthews. <laughs> I was trying to think. I think I. I think I met Mike almost over a decade now, about ten years ago. Yeah. Yes, I was looking at that, and I like I went back and was checking that, and it was actually in July of 2012. Well, look so, at that. Yeah. 10 years ago. Happy anniversary, oh, yeah. baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Happy 10th. I didn't get you any flowers. I'm sorry. I, yeah, same here. I didn't I didn't get you any either, but yeah. But yeah, that that was it's been cool cuz I was thinking about that earlier and I was looking that up and I was just like it's been 10 years. Yeah. yeah. Cuz you came out to well, like one of the first ones that we did. It's one of those, uh, you know, we're getting older, so time is flying by. We're quickly closing uh, in on, we're cl quickly closing in on becoming the thing that we have been searching for our whole lives. Boy, I, I know that feeling really well. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I got one in the grave and one on a banana peel, and uh, it's like just waiting to slip. So. The thing is, and you you know this, and I'm sure the people listening know this too, who watch paranormal television shows. It is going to be very soon that someone is going to pitch to one of these streaming services or a network like a, a paranormal team that's in a retirement community. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's a, yeah, you know, it'd be a, it'd be a great title. Somebody's in there, Paranormal Senior Citizens Investigation or something like that. Yep. So. <laughs> they're paranormal Senior Citizens, they're looking for what they're about to become. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> yeah. Waiting to see who the last one will be standing. So, <laughs> yeah, yep. You know, what? Then, I, like, I, then, in, then, in, then in the third season, the people from the first season, the, the third season is obviously all new senior citizens because the people from the first season, <laughs> the past. So, the third season is trying to contact the people from the first season. <laughs> You know, we laugh, but there's some producer someplace is right now writing like, that's a hell of an idea. So. Right? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Yep. You know, I'd like, I, I would like, I've been thinking about this and, you know, with the conspiracy theories and <clears throat> all this stuff. And, you know, I, I, I know some, a lot of, a lot of the stuff that, you know, you, you, uh, you research and stuff like that. But I've got a question. If there was like, Someone in the world that knew everything about everything. What would be the one mystery that would be the thing that you'd be like, hey, fill me in. Let me know exactly. You know what I mean? Let me know all the details about this or that. This is true. That's whatever it is, you know? I mean, I would like to say that. 
I would like to say that I would ask about life after death or extraterrestrials. Like if it's going to be one of the two, it's going to be either of those two things. But when I sit and think about that question to myself and I go through my own psychology, I don't, I'm mean, for as crazy as it sounds doing this now for 32 years or whatever, like, I don't really know if I want to know the answer. Mm -hmm. Like, I think part of the beauty of what we do is that it's this never ending quest and we always find new avenues to think about and it expands our horizons. And I can only mm -hmm. like wish that my mind remains pliable enough over the years to keep accepting new ideas and new theories and think about new things. I feel like there would be a part of me that once I knew the answer, I'd, I'd be like, oh, shit, I guess I'd just make sandwiches and sit in my house for the rest of my life. Kind of like magic. It's like if you know the trick, then you're just like, yeah, I don't, I don't care. I don't, there's nothing to first, learn there. You know what? When I first started really investigating paranormal phenomena back in the 90s, one of the first things I did, I wanted to know how I could be fooled. So I joined the International Brotherhood of Magicians and the Society for American Magicians. I made friends with illusionists because I wanted to know, you know, the hand is faster than the eye. I want to know how my brain could be tricked. And it, you, you're absolutely right, Mike. It's one of those things. It's like once you start learning tricks and you're like, oh, it's it's really that simple. Like, yeah. you know, flipping one card over and you're just moving your hand in a certain way and it looks like this miracle is performed. Like it really does. I mean, I still love magic and I wa love watching people do it. Yeah. But, but even now, like we exist in a world which didn't exist in the 90s where I can go on YouTube and look up a magic trick that I can't figure out. And then I can slow the speed down half speed and look at exactly at their hands while they're doing it. And I can figure it out. So, you know, it is kind of gone in that sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's kind of like those guys are in Michigan or wherever they are digging, looking for the, uh, what's, what's the, uh, the treasure show that they're, uh, they're digging out there. I, I don't, I don't watch it, but, uh, they've been down for a few years now. You know, the, uh, Somebody knows who I'm talking about, but I can't. I don't. I don't watch mm. it, so it's on reruns every once in a while. But they're up there with the uh, the oh the big cranes digging and everything, looking for the lost uh, treasure or something like that, and they never find it. It's like if they oh Oak Island, yeah, Patsy knows, yeah, Oak Island, yeah, that's yeah. the one I was thinking about. And uh, but yeah, it's like they're digging for that treasure, and if they find it, the show's over. Right. So exactly. Like, yeah. So, so they'll never find it because <laughs> if they do, then it's like that's it, we're done. So. Yeah, the network is banking on them never actually resolving the television <laughs> show. Right. <laughs> yep. And, uh, and then when they find it, like it's at the end of season four, then the then the network's like, all right, well, we're canceling you. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, you're canceled. <clears throat> Marla's already got it figured out for us. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> You even got the sponsor for us. There you go. Yeah, it all makes sense now. It's all see the whole thing's mm -hmm. coming together. There's some producer right now yep. watching this. Yeah. Don't anyone be surprised <laughs> next week when the announcement comes. I get I'm just you know, I'm just sitting in my head thinking chip coffee sitting back back like, don't you dare call me and ask me to be on that group. <laughs> <laughs> And Zap is like, oh, hell yes, you are. <laughs> right? <laughs> the thing is, though, it's crazy, too, because in the opposite direction, like, it, it's really weird for me to think that when I started, when I started doing this, like, I really didn't know anyone who could honestly say, like, I've been investigating ghosts since I was eight or nine or 10 years old. Like, they might have had an interest. I think all children have interests in Bigfoot and monsters and UFOs and that type of stuff. But, you know, to be a real actual researcher and going to locations and doing investigations. But we now live in an era, and you guys can attest to this, there are 9- and 10-year-olds and 8-year-olds coming to investigations. And they know the equipment and they know the terms and they're working out their ideas. And, you know, where I started... Act, you know, I, where I consider started doing investigations, like I said, 32 years ago, there are going to be kids that are my age who started 10 or 15 years before I did. 
So, you know, where I can say I've done this for 32 years, there's going to be kids in the future who will be 50 years old who have said, who will honestly be able to say, like, I've been investigated for 40 years. Yeah. yeah I, hear, I hear a few of those people now that say they've been doing that stuff for that long, but, you know, I don't think that they ever have. I think it's just like they may have had an interest, like you said, but I don't consider that like I've been investigating since I was 12 years old, unless you've actually been doing it. Um, yeah. You know, watching Scooby Doo back in 1969 doesn't mean you're a terrible <laughs> investigator. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, you're we right, see Robin. A lot of kids I, that come out there at the Ashmore, we do Kids Day, and and you're right. They know the equipment. They're they're familiar with the stuff. They know. How to, I had one walk in. Had the he had this little black rim glasses on and his hat, and he had this K2 meter and his recorder, and he was like eight years old. He's like ready to go. Yep. Yep. And. Um, Brian Danhausen, researcher from Detroit, who's a friend of mine, uh, he and I and Jessica, who's the co-host on my podcast, mm -hmm. you know, there's a teacher here at one of the junior highs and her history group, the kids have a ghost hunting group. And so, you know, she brought us in to investigate a location. And I'll tell you what, some of these, you know, 11, 12 year old kids, I've rarely uh, I've seen it, but rarely have seen people investigate in this day and age with so much kindness and respect as these kids have at 11 or 12 years old. You know, we were doing an EVP session and you could, I told them you can ask, you know, pretty much anything you want, but you know, don't try and get too dark with it, but you can ask any question that you want, you know, so ask your question. And one of the, these students, I think, probably about 12 years old, he said, well, I don't have a question, but I want to say something. And I said, go ahead. And he kind of lifted his head up toward the air, you know, in the darkness. And he said, I don't know if anybody's here and I don't know who you were, but I hope that when you lived your life, you were happy. And I hope that you're okay right now. And I was like, how many adult investigators take the time to do that when they're investigating? Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> yeah. 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 How many adults even do that? period but they're investigating or not so. right how many adults do something like that to their living friends that they know yeah exactly yeah <laughs> you know speaking of kids um there was i had a question like i remember an interview you did this has been quite a while back a little girl asked you about um dinosaurs ghost dinosaurs I don't know if yeah. you remember that one or not. It was it was Charlotte's daughter. It was uh, Amy Bruni. Was it? Excuse me, Amy Bruni's daughter, Charlotte. Yeah, we were in New Orleans, and Charlotte said something to Amy, and Amy said, "I don't know. Ask Tenny. He knows all the weird stuff." <laughs> and I think Charlotte was probably five or six, and she said, "Why don't we ever see dinosaur ghosts?" And like it just popped out of my mouth, I said to Char, "I looked. I looked at Charlotte, and I said, Why do you think we can't catch the Loch Ness monster?'" <laughs> I think maybe the Loch Ness Monster is a Pleiosaur ghost, you know? Maybe that's one of the reasons that we get Thunderbird sightings to this day. Maybe we're seeing the ghosts of dinosaurs, even to the extent of maybe some Bigfoot sightings. Maybe we're seeing Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal ghosts walking around, and that's one of the reasons we can't catch them. That's yeah. kind of the Newkirk's idea on that, isn't it? <clears throat> Greg and I had many, many discussions about that because, you know, the concept of... Bigfoot, if you go back to the earliest original inhabitants of America and the, and the aboriginal tribes and Native Americans who lived here, Bigfoot is much more akin to a ghost than it is to a physical creature. It's a nature spirit. It's an earth elemental. It's not a physical creature. And so when you, when you keep in mind where the original stories stemmed from, then Bigfoot is very much more like a ghost than it is a physical creature. And in my world, my world is big enough and wide enough and weird enough. I think that there might be Bigfoot that are ghost-like. I think that there are Bigfoot that are probably extraterrestrial-like. I think that there are probably Bigfoot that are just big hominids walking around in the woods. Like, uh, my world is weird enough to contain all of them. <clears throat> this is a nice little tribute here, John. Yep. Well, look at that. See, that is a pretty nice tribute. Look at that. Hi, Misty, by the yeah. way. Hello. So, Misty, yeah. how old is your son now? Maybe this John is going to make me feel good. old. <laughs> <laughs> He's 42. <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden, I'm time traveling, too, aside from ghost hunting. 
I hung out with her son uh, at the jail, the Mike, the Dillinger jail. Yeah. Yeah. Crown Point. Yeah. Crown Point. And again, that was probably, God, it's got to be seven or eight years ago now. Yeah, she said he's driving now. Oh, my goodness gracious. Oh, God. Well, folks, that's the show for me. I have to go and pass out. Well, John, you're going to be a member of Piss before you know it. I might might already be there. (laughs) So, now, I mean, we talk to ghosts a lot and all, but you're really into the UFO type of stuff, too, quite a bit, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Um, So just to quickly run down kind of my history or where it all kind of came from. I was a punk rock kid in the eighties hanging out wherever there were other weird people, which was usually metaphysical conventions because they were people kind of on the fringe and outside the norm. And that's where I felt most comfortable. And that's kind of where I met my first uh, slew of witches and magic practitioners and uh, Reiki healers and that type of stuff. But I also met my first, mentor craig who his specialty was political assassinations of the 60s and 70s so when i first started lecturing it was about jfk rfk mlk malcolm x fred hampton black panther party that type of stuff and uh really quickly when you start to get involved with government research like that you end up stumbling into the world of ufos because you start learning about how the government covers things up how government operates top secret security clearances that type of thing so then the second round of like i went from lecturing about government conspiracies and assassinations to ufos and then i think it was just a natural outgrowth after ufos with ufos you're dealing with lights in the sky and disembodied voices and you know, abductions that sound a lot like sleep paralysis and use poltergeist phenomena you see in in UFO accounts. And so it was just a kind of natural growth into ghosts for me. But I love UFOs. I really do think that my favorite topic, like if I had to pick one of like out of the big three, Bigfoot UFOs and ghosts, I think that if someone told me like, you can only continue to read about and learn one of those three topics, I would probably pick UFOs. I was telling Robin before we started, I was like watching UFOs, the lost evidence or something like that. And I was like, oh crap, I gotta, I gotta go get the computer yeah. going. Yeah. <laughs> now, a, a couple of years ago, I, I let you borrow a Frank's box. And, you know, a lot of people think that Frank was doing these basically for ghosts, but he was really into the UFO type of things. Absolutely. More than ghosts. And, uh, now did, and don't go in details because I know a lot of this is personal, but, uh, did, uh, did you try to communicate with UFOs with you at the at the uh, Frank's box? I absolutely did. Yes, and I think that <clears throat> Frank's the Frank's box I was experimenting with. I think that it served its perfect its purpose exactly as it was designed to fulfill. That's great. Uh, yep, and uh, yeah, those those boxes are just incredible because they he all he had all the little designs of different. Uh, UFO type of pictures and you know things that you think about like that is you know on those boxes. So um, he just came across my feed. I think it was yesterday, or maybe even this morning, that I was talking and Frank and I had a conversation back and forth on Facebook a little bit, but never had a chance to meet him. I don't, I don't know if you've met Frank or not. If you had a chance to or not, I think we just exchanged <laughs> messages on forums back and forth. Yeah, and that's kind of how I was. I was actually when uh, Mike had an event out at the Stanley Hotel. And I had planned on taking a side trip and going to see Frank and, uh, and meet him. And he passed away that September, I think it was. And uh, so I didn't get a chance to see him. And I was really hoping to. And his wife just recently passed away, I believe, also. Yeah. Yeah, he actually came up uh, at the event this last weekend in Missouri because someone was asking me about, have I ever used Frank's boxes to <clears throat> talk to ghosts? And I had to explain, like, well, I've seen people use Frank's boxes to talk to ghosts. But, you know, and then I had to explain that that's not why they were originally designed the way they were designed and or what he intended them to do right yep that was not his intention whatsoever it was to to the ghost but you know so it's kind of like some of that stuff kind of goes both ways i suppose it it, uh, it can work in either direction but he's he's uh he was quite progressive with uh, with what he was doing and a lot of people now are kind of copying or doing something similar to what that you know what frank was doing 
For sure. And you know, the, the other thing is too, you know, if you, when you deep dive these weird questions of all this strange stuff that we investigate, you know, the, the, the question comes up too, like if there are aliens, like when they died, like, do we get alien ghosts? And then when you're using a Frank's box, like, <clears throat> I guess you can be talking to a ghost, but it's also an alien ghost. So it seems to be working all right still. Yep. That's, I've had people come up to me over the weekend and tell me, ask me about certain names that they picked up out of Ashmore. And it's like, have you ever had this name? I'm like, there was 200 people died in this building. There was thousands that came through this building. I imagine about every name possible is out there. I said, just because you're, somebody says that you're pulling up this name doesn't even mean that's their name. It could be anything. They could talk about sure. anybody's name. For sure. And you, <clears throat> the, the other question, because I was ans answering a lot of questions this weekend, you know, the, the other thing is, you know, we have our preconceived ideas of what ghosts are and how they might act and what they might be going through, but none of us really know what's going on. And we've got good ideas we can exchange with each other, but, you know, a ghost might not be locked in a certain location. Like if I'm me after, if, if some part of me persists after I die and I'm just not tethered to my body anymore and I can go anywhere I want to, then I'm not going to be just in this house walking around like clanking dishes in my house. I spent, I lived here. Like I'm going to go to those locations where I have wonderful memories or where special events happened and I might be there one day and gone the next day. So when someone says, you know, oh, was there ever a Paul here? Like maybe, maybe sometime in the past 75 <laughs> years, someone named Paul came here and loved it and has, is coming to visit right now. Yep. I agree with you. Yeah. It's like, you never know. We have no way of knowing. You know, I, I always kind of tell people the only thing we really know about the paranormal is we don't really know anything about the paranormal. Yeah, for sure. But the other thing is too, and, and I say this at my lectures, if there's no such thing at all, if there are no ghosts, if it's, if it's, if it's not real, if just the concept, if just the idea of ghosts is real, then that affords us an opportunity to talk to other people about what we think about, what we feel, what's in our heart, what's in our mind, which makes even the concept of ghosts extremely important to us. Like, mm -hmm. even if there's no yeah. actual ghost, if it's just a mechanism for us to share with each other our experiences and our feelings, then it's it's vastly important. Yeah. yeah. No, I agree. You know, just like you said, you know, earlier with the convention, things like that, because of the search, or the search for ghosts, it brings lots of people together and you meet a lot of people, and a lot of good people, and you have, a, you know, just a lot of good friends are made out of, a, out of this whole situation looking for ghosts. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And, you know, I feel very honored sometimes when, I mean, not sometimes, anytime, but I feel very honored when someone pulls me aside or comes up to me when I'm smoking or sees me at an event and asks if they can talk to me. When someone tells, says out loud, like their ghost story for the first time, like that's an amazing like part of a person's life that they no longer feel scared that they trust you enough to tell you the story that they've carried around with them, you know, to, to see people open up. That's an amazing thing that happens in this community too. You know, there's a lot of people who will show up at these events who I've never done this before and I've never had any experiences. And then, you know, after they warm up and they see the crowd and they talk to other people around, they'll find someone and say, well, I did have something happen once when I was, you know, 12, 9, whatever. And they open up their, about their experience. And that's pretty an amazing thing. I had some times like a few people come in here and have things at Rhodes Hotel. And, you know, they'll sit down and be like, oh, you know, I'll tell you this. You might think <laughs> I'm crazy. I'm like, ah, try me. <laughs> it's like, let's hear it. Go ahead. Try me. You, you might be amazed that I might not be, you know, too shocked. Even when I do yeah, my I lectures, even when I do my <laughs> lectures, you know, sometimes I'll start them off by saying, you know, if I'm going to ask some questions here and I want you to raise your hands, but then I have to qualify it for if it's a large crowd, I have to say, now, listen, if someone asks you these questions in your normal everyday life, you probably wouldn't raise your hand to it because you don't want to think that they're you're weird. I'm like, but in this crowd of people right here, everyone sitting next to you is as weird as you are. So go ahead and raise your <laughs> hand up. <high." laughs> 
I had some friends from high school that over here. This was like, um, our, we're coming up on our, not too far from our 50th you know, anniversary, you know, from graduation, but uh, they came over a couple years ago and, you know, and because they wanted to experience the ghost situation here. I live in an old movie theater that's haunted as well. And uh, so we kind of wandered around and we just did a walkthrough and I had a recorder and we came back and sat down and played it. And there was like two or three different EVPs that popped up on there. And the one guy is a CPA. And he's like, you know, he said, everything in my world is white and black. He said, I don't understand this. He said, I'm not going to say that it's a ghost, but it doesn't make sense to me. And he said, I can't figure it out. And uh, so he's like, I just don't know what to think. He said, I would have thought that, okay, if you'd have, if you'd have gone back in your office and came back out and put something out here, let us listen to it. He said, then I would have thought, okay, yeah, you faked it. But he said, you just took your recorder, pulled it out, put it in your computer, and we all threw headphones on at the same time and started listening. He's like, there's stuff in there that doesn't make sense. And, and I think that's what's kind of cool, with, especially with skeptics. And I'm not one that, if you're a skeptic, great. I'm, I am too. I'm skeptical as well. But and I'm not I'm not here to try to teach some skeptic that there's really ghosts. I don't. It's not my problem. Not my job. You know, if you want to believe it or not believe it, that's okay. But it's always kind of fun when you hear somebody's like, it's, I just don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me. I'm like, yeah, welcome to my role. I don't know. I don't understand it either. <laughs> I mean, and the the great thing is too is that kind of what I was saying about solving it and like if I can ask someone, Mike, like you asked me, mm -hmm. you know, this weekend. The conversations, it's amazing to me, like the conversations and the the ideas and the kind of intellectual growth, like it's just this amazing thing that continues. I mean, I was sitting at a table with, with Chip Coffee, and Chip and I have known each other now almost 15 years, and just we were just bouncing questions off of each other about the nature of ghosts and the nature of good and evil and reality and existence and it's like, oh, wow, we've done this for so long and we've been in so many situations, but we're still willing to just sit and ask some basic questions to see if anything new has changed. And like, it's amazing that 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 goes on. I always get really scared when someone comes up to me and says, well, let me tell you right now, I know exactly what's happening here. Like, that's when I start to go, OK, we're 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 heading down a really weird narrow road because they might know exactly what's happening for them, but for yeah. them to know exactly what's happening about anything in the whole world with a definitive answer, I, I don't think is a, a very likely scenario. You know, one of the things you were talking about, like the, the whole, you know, not being stuck in one location and, you know, all this other stuff with the, the traveling and everything. It, it, it's, it's, I'm just going to go ahead and ask this question and get it out of the way. If, if there's some, I ask everybody this just to see, you know, we get all kinds of cool responses from this, but if there was any location in the world that you could go to and investigate, where would you go to? You know, I still, I, st I and it comes from a childhood fascination. I would, I would want to investigate all over South America like around Peru and, and, uh, Cusco, like, like there's just something about when I was a kid looking at South American temples and pyramids that just fascinated me to no end. And it's one of the places I haven't been. And I just want to go and see these. I mean, I've, I've seen a couple temples in like Honduras and Belize, but the big ones and even like the Nazca lines, the giant drawings down in the South American desert that you can only see from the air. I would love to investigate places like that. Yeah, that would be cool. Good answer. So, you know, with the, uh, the one show that you were on as, as, as recently, I guess, or maybe not quite recently, but, uh, you know, with Chad. Yeah. So, what, you know, and we all know Chad. And uh, but what was, what was it like? Because that was the first time I think you met Chad, wasn't it? So, yeah, the network, before the show came on, if I'm remembering this correctly, the network said, we want, you guys don't know each other, and we want to know if you're going to get along. So they booked us, up, Chad and I, a hotel, like, in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> and made us spend, like, four days together in this hotel. Oh, wow. like, there was nobody else staying at the hotel. <laughs> like, there was nothing around it. The closest restaurant was, like, a Ruby Tuesdays that was, like, a few <laughs> miles away, uh, and um that's that was really when we met and i think honestly 
it was probably it was one of those kind of friendships that we knew we were going to get along and be friends within the first like 15 minutes yep he's an easy one to get along with most of the time too so yeah it had to be you know because he's never really he didn't investigate a lot before that show though did he no i think he had only <laughs> ever done two investigations and they were both for the television show so he had never really right. done any type of investigation just as to do an investigation so i mean i think the other thing is too is when you watch ghost stalkers like people have this idea that maybe he has you know because the other thing is too is when you create a show like you obviously you create it with this like pitch line and and one of the pitch lines for ghost stalkers was you know uh, someone who has investigated for decades paired with someone who has never investigated before and watch the differences between them and, and the reactions between them and, and what, what may or may not happen in a paranormal, paranormal situation to them because of those different experiences. But they never tell you that when you start watching the show, you just start watching the show and it's two guys hunting ghosts and one of them freaks out all the time. But I mean, you take a grown person and you put them in a notoriously haunted location in the dark and say, okay, now you got to be in there for eight hours. And there's some, been some horrible stuff that's happened in here. They're a, a regular person who has not done like anything like that ever. Their mind can go a little haywire. Yep. And you're by yourself, by the way, too. I mean, there's nobody can be around. And if you need anything, the walkie talkie, just he'll be out there to be in. Just, just let him know. He'll come mm -hmm. in here when he gets a chance, as long as it's working. Well, and that was a big thing too about ghost hunt or ghost stalkers that we had to, uh, we had to really go round and round with the network because usually when you film any kind of paranormal reality show, you know, there's a camera crew and a sound guy and your mic packed and usually outside the location, there's a craft service table. So you have water <laughs> and something to eat. And I told the network when we filmed it, like, if we're going to say we're alone, then we have to be alone. Like, as soon as the sun goes down, you wrap the crew and send them back to the hotel. And it's just going to be Chad and I. We have to run everything. And that it caused it, like, it was it was great because it was what I wanted. It caused, a, we had to, there was a big learning curve, though, because, like, you also need footage to make a show. So, you know, if I'm alone in a building and I leave the living room and walk into the kitchen... You need video footage of me walking into the kitchen or you don't know that I've moved into a new room. So I would have to move a camera, place it toward the kitchen, walk past it so you could see me walking into the kitchen. Then I'd have to turn around, walk back, grab the camera, pick it up, move it into the kitchen and start filming again. So every time I was filming, I'm also having to move all these cameras around so that you could see me and where I was at. And like we learned to do it, but it made investigation for me a lot more interesting because I had gotten so used to just being my, with my handy cam in a location by myself. And now I've got, you know, multiple cameras shooting different angles, which are eyes that, you know, I wouldn't have normally had looking down hallways that I couldn't have seen before if I wasn't doing that show, stuff like that. So it was, it was interesting and it almost made, it almost returned like paranormal investigating to this, kind of innocent, happy, fun thing that I remember doing. How often did you uh, maybe run across the network saying, we want to cut this part out. We don't, we don't want to put this in the show that maybe it was something that you felt should be in there. You know what I mean? Oh, there was a lot. Uh, there's one, there was one case that Chad and I did. We shot the whole thing. And on Chad's night in, I still think about this to this day, just one of the, I, I don't even know, wrapping my brain around it. Chad walked out after a whole night of investigating and I'm outside by myself and I film him walking out to me and he walks up to me and he, he gives me a hug and then he turned and started walking away. And I put the camera down because I wanted to know where he was going. Cause he's just, we're, we're in a city. We don't know anything that's going on in that city. And he started walking down the block. It was a Sunday morning, and I'm, I just followed him. I didn't have my camera at that time. And, uh, oh, no, I did. He, he still had his. That's what it was. He still had his. And he, as I got up close to him, following behind him, he handed me his camera, which was still rolling. And I said, what are you doing? He wouldn't say anything to me. He was actually following. He had heard Sunday morning. He had heard church bells, and he was walking to this church, and he walked 
right in the front door in the middle of a Sunday service at a church, walked right through the crowd, right up to the front of the church where the priest was doing the service. And he said, I need you to bless me after what just happened last night. And the priest stopped the service and blessed Chad, you know, sprinkled him with some holy water, gave him a hug. And then Chad stood up and I filmed the whole thing. And the network was like, we're not going to show that. People don't want to see that. You know, that, that's a pretty, that's been a pretty interesting uh, clip to show. But I can also yeah. see where the, the, the show may say, oh, that was all staged. It's just, you know, just, yep. it's just for TV. But Yeah. So. But it was just, there was another moment too. There was one, I think we were in Tennessee and we had finished, uh, we had just finished. It was our like last night in Tennessee. And Chad and I were at the hotel and Chad may, thought maybe, you know, something had attached to him or that he had brought something back to the hotel. And I went out to have a cigarette and I didn't have a camera. I mean, we weren't filming. We were wrapped, getting ready to go home. And I went out to have a cigarette and Chad was standing in this rural Tennessee hotel parking lot way off in the distance by himself. And he was smudging himself off in the distance. And I thought, well, that's a really cool moment. That's no one's ever going to see except for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if you had to pick out one of the uh, one of the episodes from Ghost uh, Ghost Offers, which uh, being your favorite, which one would it have been? Uh, you know, I really, really liked uh, the last episode of Ghost Stalkers was for our schoolhouse in, in Iowa. And I really loved the idea... And Ghost Stalkers is old, older now. I mean, I think Ghost Stalkers was 2014. So, you know, it was a few years ago now. But we were one of the first shows to, you know, put blood pressure cuffs and EEG monitors on someone and look at people's <clears throat> brainwave patterns and what their body was doing and reacting. I think that's still something that should be done in paranormal television right now to see how much the influence is on our physiology aside from our psychology. Uh, and that episode is, I think the first time on a paranormal show at the very end, I talk about the psychical research society in the 1800s and the original ghost hunters, the people who first looked for ghosts. I think that was the first time that those people were ever mentioned on a paranormal reality show. And plus, I think we did really good work at that, at that place. Um, I had some weird, you know, there was a weird electronic uh, malfunction that was happening with my tape recorder that I just could not explain. And I caught it all in the moment. The fact that my, re I, I, if I was standing in the building with my recorder, it would work. But if I went outside, it would stop. And I, in the moment, I literally like held the camera in front of my face and propped the door open with my arm. And I would record in right inside the door and it would work. And I would move it six inches outside the building or it wouldn't work. And then I would move it six out inches out the building and it would start working again and just back and forth. And you like in the moment, you can see like something is happening right at this doorway. That still kind of freaks me out. Yeah. You mentioned the blood yeah. pressure cuff and all. I used to do that in investigations. I would get baseline vitals. I'm an EMT. So yep. I get baseline vitals on everybody in our group before we started because it's almost like a lie detector. Yep. Because if, if you all of a sudden you look over, and it's like, oh, my God, I see this full body apparition over in the corner and your pulse was 60. If it's not 100 by now, you're just lying to me. <laughs> <laughs> Simple as that. <laughs> well, and the thing is now, like I said, like I still think it's something that should be done on shows. And we've reached a point now where it's so easy. It's like put a watch or a ring on someone and and, and hook an app up and, and, right. and you you can monitor everyone in the location. You know, plus you can ping what rooms they're in, what time it is. As soon as that starts to change while they're doing an EVP uh, session, while they're doing, you know, working with a spirit board or a Frank's box or something, you can see like as they're interacting, is anything happening to them physiologically? Yep. Yeah, I did that a few heart. years back. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I took a heart monitor because we were having some issues here with a uh, with serial killer ghost in my building. And uh, so I wore a heart monitor that one night we investigated just to see if there was any fluctuation, any changes in it. And it didn't change that night, but, uh, but yeah, it was one of those things that something a little bit different and that you can use without the, you know, that most people aren't going to. Right. Misty wants to know if you're coming back to Crown Point Jail. I mean, I, you know, if ever I'm invited, I'll go back. <laughs> if I got time open and 
I'll go. I listen. I I like going anywhere. Someone's just got to ask me. Fig- I got to figure out a way to get there. You know, the last couple of years, it's been hard for me to travel because the last like almost three years, I was taking, I was doing in home care for my parents. I moved them into my house. So I'm also readjusting back to since my mom passed away and my dad moved up north, like readjusting to back being a single man who can do anything he wants to. <laughs> that's a that's yeah. a hard lesson to re- return to. Oh, yeah, about investigating someone's home, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I still get requests for residential cases. I've investigated a ton of residential homes. I've investigated a lot of my friends' homes. You know, people obviously know what I do. And for as many times as I've had friends that have laughed at me because I'm that weird guy that talks about ghosts and UFOs, I'm also that guy that they come to when they're like, there's something screwed up happening in my house. Can you come check it out? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I think we've I think we've all had that experience where someone who has probably laughed at us multiple times behind our backs or in front of our mm-hmm. faces has eventually realized <laughs> they might need our services. <laughs> yeah, I I mentioned before we had a uh, in a police officer. I'm in a small town, and they had a police officer. We had called out the psychiatric uh, call one night for EMS, and and Jack walked out. He's like, "Hey, Robin, would you go ahead and talk to this guy?" I'm like, why? He's like, "He's seeing pink elephants." I'm like. I don't do pink elephants. I do ghosts. <laughs> There's a big difference. <laughs> Robin, can you so, come out here and talk to this guy? He says he's seeing purple princesses. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> now see that? Now I want to investigate. Now I, I'd be in the house real quick. Like, Frank, where you at, Frank? <laughs> <laughs> we did pick um, that up on our, uh, Frank's box one night when uh, we were I had a, some people that were using, they wanted to know how to use them. And so I pulled one down, I was using it. And I said, uh, turn it on, let it run for a little bit here, just kind of get situated in the room and all. And I said, and just start to just ask questions. And so I, I, my first question I asked like, so do you know who built this box? And it said, Frank. And I'm like, okay, that's kind of a random name, but at the same time, it's the right, it's the sure. right name. I said, so if you know Frank built this box, then you know what he thought he was. And it said purple princess. I'm like, oh crap. So it's right? like, yeah. And, and I'm like, I might turn white, my hair stand up my arms. The girls are like, what's so weird about that? I'm like, you don't know, but Frank actually thought that he was, I think he, was, he thought he was abducted or by aliens or something and was coming back as a purple princess or something. So it's amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they actually got the same thing in Chicago. I let them borrow the box and they took it to Chicago. They asked those same questions. They got the same answers. I might have had I might have had a similar experience when I was ha- experimenting with the box. Oh yeah, well, yeah. that's cool. <laughs> what were you going to say, Mike? You looked like you were going to say something. Did we step I, on you? I don't remember it. It flew by me now. I don't remember. <laughs> Sorry right, though. This is all interesting. Oh wait, I do remember. Yeah, like, do you have like a, a favorite place like that you investigate, like in Michigan, like over the years? You know what I mean? Like one of those places that you just there's a, there, there, it, I mean, sometimes I will criticize the quietness of cemeteries, but like the place that I've probably done the most investigations and spent the most time in, <clears throat> right, probably about a mile and a half away from my house is a cemetery that I've gone to since I was, you know, 16 or 17, even before I was hunting ghosts. But, you know, I trained people in that cemetery on, you know, some etiquette being quiet and respectful and you know not leaving trash or cigarette butts all over the place not smoking while you're taking pictures and in michigan like not exhaling right before you take a photograph but so yeah saint mary's cemetery in royal oak plus it's a cemetery that has it was in one location in in my hometown of royal oak and then it was moved to the location it is now and it actually got slightly smaller over the years because uh, they had to put a road through, and so the graves were so old when they put the road through, they put the headstones, they moved the headstones, but the road goes right over the top of some of the, the graves that were there. Mm-hmm. And I get, I wow. still, to this day, get reports of, you know, cars driving on that little stretch of road, and they'll see someone in the road, and as the car nears them, they'll just kind of poof away. That's wild. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> Be investigating a former come. Um, 
No, I mean, you know, my tips to uh, anybody when they investigate is, you know, I'm not a big aggressive provoking person. I always try and treat potential spirits and ghosts the way I would want to be treated and the way that I treat normal human beings. I don't think it's a good thing to walk up behind a human being and scream, please talk to me at the back of their head. So I don't think I would ever do that to a ghost. I always just show a lot, try and show respect. And I also try to remember that, you know, human beings, the two major fears of human beings are public speaking and death in that order. There are more people afraid of speaking in public than they are of dying. And when you're dealing with spirits or potential ghosts or alleged entities that, you know, are dead, they're not even afraid of being dead anymore. They only have one fear left, which is public speaking. And that's all we demand ghosts do. Like stand in the middle of the room, talk to us, tell us your story. Um, so I think kindness and caring really helps with any investigation. Like just open up your mind, open up your heart, be cautious, caring. Don't dwell too much on that negative stuff. You know, a lot, we were talking earlier about the kids and the way they investigate. You, both of you know, Sometimes you'll get adults in there and that's all they want to do is how horrible was it when you died? Did it hurt when you were bleeding out on the floor? Like, and they just go to these dark places and like, if I was a ghost that had died, I don't want to probably talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. We had somebody left at Ashmore. They were, they were asking, you know, we had the, the young child that died for his result from her burns that she caught in the morning and she was not quite five years old yet. And they were, they started asking questions about, the burns and you know the pain from the burns and everything and there was another girl there about eight years old who actually talks to this girl she lives down the street she would talk to this girl from time to time he would go down and visit her at her house and she has she's like mom she's like she doesn't like to talk about that stuff why do they keep bringing it up and uh, it's like you know there's so much truth to that it's like nobody wants to talk about the bad thing that happened to them why they got killed it's like you know when you got yeah. decapitated did that hurt no, it was right. felt great, you know, so it's like, why did we ask such stupid questions? Yeah, I mean, one of the questions <clears throat> that I ask very often when I do investigations is, you know, can you tell me the name of someone that you loved? Is there someone that you love that I can get in contact with for you? You know, like, of course, like, if, again, if something of me persists after I die, like, I'm going to want to reach out and find out what happened to my loved ones. And, and probably, you know, those loved ones are the things keeping me somewhat grounded in this new experience of being a ghost. Not that, you know, I was killed, murdered. It's horrible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Natalie's asking about gin. Um, what's really interesting for me, so I live in Royal Oak, Michigan, which is about 11 miles from Detroit, which is about 15 miles from Dearborn. And Dearborn is the largest Middle Eastern community just outside of the Middle East. And so for as long as I've investigated ghosts, I get residential calls and, and emails for decades from Dearborn. And in Dearborn, they don't have ghosts. They have gin, just the, the, the difference in cultures, you know, and, uh, so I've investigated a lot of, of uh, gin encounters. Uh, I've had to deal with a lot of, uh, and it's weird because a lot of gin encounters will manifest as what we would call elemental encounters. So uh, constant water appearing in the house or stuff is continuing to be set on fire. Uh, weird, strange winds that will blow through the house and knock stuff off shelves and voices that come in that sound like thunder. But so that's been super interesting. It's really interesting for me because it offers me a unique perspective growing up and investigating <clears throat> those ideas that are so separate from our normal culture. Because if someone, you know, from, uh, I don't know, Ohio calls me and tells me, you know, I've got a poltergeist in my house and it's set stuff on fire. Like my mind also is able to go to the idea of like, well, you might have a poltergeist or something in your house that's setting on fire, but you might have a gin in your house that that's not meaning to cause any problems. It's just doing what it does. And maybe that's the solution. Cause again, we're putting, we're giving names to all these things that none of us know what they are. Right. Yeah. Have that's I ever had some questions tonight? Yeah, have you ever had something yeah. follow me home? I'm sure that I have had something follow me home, but my friends and I all talk about over the years I've created this kind of psychic force field around my house because I do travel so much and I do go to so many locations. 
Uh, and nothing ever gets in my house. That's for sure. Like I'm sure stuff might be just standing beyond the border waiting for that force field to come down. Uh, I had uh, wanted to do a Facebook live investigation one time with with Greg and Dana Newkirk, but we couldn't do we couldn't do it in my house because I have this force field, and so there's like no way we could have had contact with any ghosts. So I told Dana, "Well, before you get here, I'll spend the day pulling the force field down on just the family room of my house. Uh, that way, we can do a Facebook live thing." So I spent the whole day doing this kind of ritual to pull down this psychic force field, and about twenty minutes after I did that. Uh, all of the plumbing in that part of the house uh, went bonkers and broke and flooded my crawl space. And the whole oh, no. ceiling, the whole ceiling attached yeah. to the back of my family room cracked. It's still there to this. I left it there as a reminder for me, but it looked like the back half of my house was actually pulling away from the rest of my house. So, yeah, uh, yeah crazy. I remember you telling me about that force field in Michigan last year when, when I got the Frank's box back from you. Yeah, because I had to create a whole space. Yeah, Yeah, I had to create a space outside to go and do it because I couldn't do it in the house. (laughs) It's really funny, too, because that psychic force field is so strong. Sometimes, you know, I'll experiment with doing things like astral projection, stuff like that. Uh, And for me, if I try to astral project, it's really kind of boring because I end up in my kitchen or I end up in my family room because I can't get uh, my psychic body can't get outside my psychic force field so i just kind of bounce back into the living room and i'm like well that that was a whole lot of fun <laughs> mike you gotta ask john jenny's question yeah d- I yeah he stole, some, he'll have some interesting ones yeah i stole a question that i got asked uh, when when i interviewed with jenny so jenny if you're if you're watching sorry um the question was if <clears throat> You could investigate with three people uh, alive, already passed away, or fictional. Who would you pick? I think I'll do a mix. Uh, I would love to investigate with Sherlock Holmes, with Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes, the original written version of Sherlock Holmes. That's my fictional person. Uh, Someone who died... Uh, a psychical researcher from the 1800s named Edmund Gurney. Uh, I think he did a lot. He he wrote this book called Phantasms of the Livings, which really shaped my ideas about spirits and ghosts and hauntings. So that's my historically dead person. Uh, And then living, I think living is the hardest. I'm going to go living, but I'm going to go, I'm going to twist it a little bit. So Edmund Gurney is my historical. Sherlock Holmes is my fictional. and then I'm going to warp the living one a little bit. I would love to be able to investigate with myself when I was like 12 or 13 years old. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. No, nobody said with themselves like that. So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I think it would be interesting you, to have those conversations with myself at an earlier age and, and give myself at an yeah. earlier age someone to talk to about the ideas that I was starting to have at that time. Yeah. Now, when you were when you were twelve years old, were you seeing things like as far as you know psychic abilities and all at that time? Or? No, I don't think I'm. I think I'm as psychic <clears throat> as everybody else. I think we all have a certain amount of psychic power, but I don't consider myself psychic or anything like that. I just think that at twelve or thirteen is when my brain really started popping, thinking about you know the things that you're not supposed to think about. This don't waste your time thinking about UFOs. Don't take your time thinking about the Loch Ness monster and Bigfoot and ghosts aren't real. Don't worry about it. When, you know, when all the adults were telling me not to think about that stuff, you know, I was 12 or 13. The more you tell me to not do something at 12 or 13, the more I want to do it. (laughs) You got got to experiment with it. If they tell you, no, you gotta be something good about it. If they're telling you, you can't do it for sure. That's where all the good stuff, that's where all the adult secrets are hidden. Exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. They don't want you to do it, so it's got to be something about it. So, well, let me uh, see here. I'm just because I work kind of don't want to waste your, you know, take your whole night, but let me make sure I got your uh, website. I think uh, weirdlectures.com. Yep. That's it. You can find all of my upcoming events mm-hmm. on there. And sometimes if I write stuff, it goes up on there. And then all my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff is just John E.L. Tenney, one word. And then now you've got, um, just trying to see here you have some you have books and everything too for sale someplace don't you 
Yep. All my books are available on Amazon. And if people want to hear me talk mostly about non-spooky stuff, then I have a podcast called What's Up Weirdo with my friend Jessica. And every week we just tape record a, basically a phone conversation between us. And it goes from everything from movie reviews to spooky legends and stories to sometimes it gets a little raunchy, but it's just two friends talking <laughs> to each other and a dog barking in the background. <laughs> I was going to say, you may not want to let your seven, eight-year-olds listen to that. Yeah, it's probably not appropriate for children. <laughs> so, yeah, cause I've, I've listened to some of those there. I'm like, oh, okay. So it's like, you know, it's just, it's just you. So, yeah. yeah and, the, and, and she's actually worse than you. <laughs> well, you know, it's here's the thing. Here's the thing. I am a person who has spent a lot of time at, at bars and coffee houses just hanging around listening to people's stories. And when quarantine hit, I couldn't. And... I wanted, I know that there are other people like me who just like to have background noise and feel like their friends are around. And so that was the whole kind of impetus behind what's up weirdo. It's like, you don't have to really listen to it. You can just stick it on in the background. And it sounds like you got a couple friends in your living room talking about something. You can walk into the conversation and walk out and maybe they're saying something interesting or something dumb, but it makes you feel not so alone. I feel like. Yep. Yeah, I listen to it quite a bit when I go to Ed to Ashmore. I can mm -hmm. just pop it on there and uh, listen to Spotify and just pull it up and listen to you guys ramble on on my two-hour <laughs> journey over that way. Yep. <laughs> and she's at the Stanley Hotel right now. Ah. Oh. She's on a uh, kind of cross-country nice. road trip with her dog. She's headed toward Las Vegas, but she stopped today at the Stanley to hang out. So That's cool. Ah. So, yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah. yeah. Well, you got anything else for John, Mike? I don't believe so. Uh, other than it's been fun talking. <laughs> oh no, it's always my pleasure. We should do it more often. Exactly. Yeah. yeah no, I, I've enjoyed it. It's been uh, it's been a good time, and uh, I'm mm -hmm. sure people have been you know kind of enjoying it, listening in, and everything. And you're always the wealth of information, and so easy to talk to. And uh, so if you're uh, yeah. if somebody's looking for any events and you're there, they need to check it out. Go talk to you. Just. Go up and see him. I so I think I still got your uh, poster in the back. Uh, let's see which one was it? The uh, shoot the, the little scale with uh, different if this this yes this yes, and yes and no here. And, oh yeah, the EVP chart. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, the EVP chart. Yep. Yeah, I've got one of got one of those hanging up out the in the back. I think I got that scare fest from you. Been, yeah, those are limited back. edition collectors items. <laughs> those are probably worth at least a dollar more now than they when you bought it. <laughs> ah, all right. So that, that might be one of my best investments yet. Trust me. <laughs> no, that's great. No. But thanks for uh, having me on, guys. It's been a blast. Uh, we appreciate it. Yeah, we appreciate thanks for being on. on and, yeah. uh, no problem. Have a great evening tonight. And uh, we will probably see you uh, in Michigan, Paracon. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll be there. So yeah, we'll be up yeah, that way. I'll see you then so. for sure. All right. Well, good night, John. Have a good night. Good night, gang. Bye. Yep. See you. Night. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great having John on. Yeah. He's a super yeah. guy. Yeah. Yeah. We talk fun to him, get along with there, and yep, it's fun just to sit and hang out with him at the conventions and talk to him, and you know when you get a chance yeah. to. So yep, it, it'll be good. Um, Got to talk to him <clears> for a little while tonight. <laughs> it's not yeah, not exactly. the usual. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah. So uh, let's see next week. Um, Josh Hurd from Albert yeah. Manor will be with us, and uh, so yep. So yep. Josh is a Josh is a good guy, and uh, kind of runs Melbourne Manor. Him and his partner, I think, up that way, yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. so it'll be interesting to talk to him and see what uh, see what Josh is up to. And one of the GQ guys out there, so or whatever it yeah. is, the, G yeah, crew, yeah, crew. yeah, the G crew, yep. So yeah, yeah, but, yeah. So they're good. But, yeah, yeah. So we. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, everybody tune in next week and go uh, go to the U YouTube uh, channel and subscribe to that and follow the the uh, Facebook page and all that good stuff, uh, of course, if you would. Yeah, you can check out the, you know, Lost Limbs. Mike's been working on playing with the website there, so you check that out. <clears throat> see what he's done on that and uh, see what's happening there. And like I said, jump on the YouTube channel. It's really simple, LLF. LLF Radio. So, uh, yep. Just jump out there and join in on that. So, yep. okay. Well, gonna get out of here for the evening. So, yeah. 
I will like uh, plan. talk with you soon. So yeah, I'll talk I'll to, to you to, soon. I'll go to bed. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> yeah. All right. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, guys. My name is Mike, and I'm the founder of the Lost Limbs Foundation. The Lost Limbs Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that provides assistance to amputee children in need of prosthetics. I started the charity after my own struggles, after my leg being amputated just above the knee. Prosthetics cost thousands of dollars, and the average lifespan is five to seven years on a prosthetic. Kids are constantly growing, so they'll go through multiple prosthetics throughout their life. This is the prosthetic leg that I use, and the cost was about $70,000. The Rhodes Hotel is in Atlanta, Indiana and is owned and operated by the Lost Limbs Foundation. We are currently doing photo shoots, ghost hunts, and special events to help raise money for the charity. For more information, you can go to lostlimbsfoundation.org. With your help, we can help these kids one step at a time.